everyone, welcome to the channel. We are at the beginning of the Rubicon Trail in Lake Tahoe in California. Just getting started here. Now this hike goes from D.L. Bliss State Park all the way to Emerald Bay. So that's what we're gonna do. Looks, this is the beginning of the trail. And here is a bench. I'm gonna take a little rest here. And if you look out into the water, you can see this little cove here is pretty popular. A lot of people like to do this hike one way and they'll park at D.L. Bliss hike to Emerald Bay, and then either shuttle back here or hitchhike or somehow get a ride. Unfortunately, right now, DL Bliss Park is closed and you cannot do that. What's required is that you have to hike the full out and back. So that's what I'm doing today. So I've already hiked out from Emerald Bay to here and it's 4.6 miles, plus a little extra credit I did due to parking. And then I'm gonna begin my video as the hike from DL Bliss back to Emerald Bay, so that's the way I want to do it. Parking at Emerald Bay, unfortunately, fills up quite early. It's a weekday. I got there at 9 a.m. and everything was already full. So check with DL Bliss to see if it's open before you do this hike. And also be aware that the parking at Emerald Bay fills up. If you look down there, you can see the folks with the boats down there just having fun. Looks like a nice little bay to hang out. I think it's on the shallower end, so it might be a little warmer. But anyway, I would say if you wanna park at Emerald Bay, you probably wanna be here before 8 a.m. on a weekday. And on a weekend, I have no idea, maybe before 7 a.m. What I did is I parked about a mile up the road, a mile north of Emerald Bay. Found a good parking spot, but that added a mile and a thousand feet of elevation of climbing in order for me to get on the trail. So a little extra credit. The other thing is at the beginning of the trail, there's an alternate trail it will take you up to a lighthouse. And I did that on the way out. So I'm gonna show that to you right now as we get started and you can decide if you wanna to go to the lighthouse. It's pretty cool. All right, if you look ahead right here, you can see the junction and it says Rubicon Trail right there. But if we walk around here to this side, which is the Rubicon Trail going down, it shows, it's kind of dark, I don't know if you can see that, but this is the Lighthouse Trail going up. So here's the junction. And when I came outbound, I went up to the lighthouse and that's the way you get up to the lighthouse. And that will bring you to this little wooden lighthouse here. And it's above the Rubicon Trail. So this would be a detour if you were just doing the Rubicon Trail. There's the lighthouse there on the left. At the top of the trail before you drop down to the lighthouse there's a plaque with tons of information so you can pause this and check it out if you want to read it. This has to be the most modest lighthouse I've ever seen. Here it is up close and personal. Kind of looks more like an outhouse than a lighthouse. See the pine cones hanging from the trees over there. You can hear people yelling on the motorboats out there in the water. Now the Rubicon Trail is a relatively easy trail. Pretty wide and there's going to be a lot of steps. There is a fair amount of elevation gain, but it's not too bad. You're mostly just cruising along the lake, but of course there are places where you need to climb up a little higher to avoid obstacles like we're doing right now. Now, obviously this is a very popular hike. It's one of the most popular hikes on the planet actually because of its location and the beauty of Emerald Bay. But right now, because DL Bliss is closed, and I'm pretty sure they don't even want you walking through there. So even though you can't get in and park there, I don't think you can walk through. Or maybe you can, but they don't want you to. So for that reason, I saw a lot of people around Emerald Bay where I started, but on this trail out toward DL Bliss, because DL Bliss is closed, there's nobody out here. So that makes it kind of nice actually. So what's gonna happen here is we're gonna cruise along and as we get closer to Emerald Bay, there's gonna be more people. And there's a couple of stories I wanna tell about Emerald Bay. One of them is about the, what they call the Hermit of Emerald Bay. It's a very interesting story. And then also later on, there was the Vikings Home Castle, which we're gonna to try to visit today. So we'll check that out.
I have to say this first part of the trail is really awesome. Climbing through these big boulders, great views of Lake Tahoe from above. Very nice. Here's some more steps like I was talking about. There's a lot of these, but it's again, it's, there is some elevation gain. You can see how high above the lake we are. And we go up and down a lot. This continues to go up as you can see. This is a pretty cool spot. That's from where we came. And there's great views of the lake all along here, as you can see. And then that big mountain over there, that's Heavenly Valley. If I step this way between those two trees, you can see the ski runs. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. There we go. So that's Heavenly Valley in South Tahoe. And we are gonna continue on our way along this trail high above the lake. It's just gorgeous. All right, we're coming upon one of the many lookouts along the way, and you see they put this little fence up here. But there's this big boulder on the left here, and then just a splendid view of Lake Tahoe. Once again, across the way, you can see in the center of the frame, that is Heavenly Valley. See the boats cruising down below, and we are going to continue on the trail this way. All right, if you look straight ahead there on the trail, that's Mount Talak which is, I think it's over 11,000 feet or right around 11,000 feet. It's one of the big mountains in the area, popular with backcountry skiers, etc., and hikers. Okay, so here's a sign, and you can see that Vikings home is 3.6 miles. So that means that we have traveled about one mile so far, and our destination is 3.6 miles ahead. All right, I'm thinking now might be a good time to tell the story of the uh, Emerald Bay Hermit. So back in the 1860s, early 1860s, there was a gentleman by the name of Ben Holiday. And Holiday had made quite a fortune as a kind of transportation logistics type person. He did very well. And remember California in the 1860s was just developing. It was past, the gold rush was 10 years earlier. So people had come out in droves to try to settle it, and the government was interested in giving people claims. Holiday's travels had taken him through the Emerald Bay area, and of course he fell in love with it. It's absolutely beautiful. And he staked a claim for the land around there, and he subsequently built quite a nice little place in Emerald Bay, down by the water. Of course, this is well precedes winter sports, so when it snowed in Tahoe, everybody got the heck out of here. and would come back for summer activities. So Emerald Bay was a great summer activity place. But anyway, the cottage was pretty nice and Holiday wanted somebody to caretake it in the winter, which would obviously be a very lonely job. And he found this guy by the name of Captain Richard Barter. And Barter was a British seaman and he had a career on the ocean, but he was now retired. So this job just seemed perfect for him. And Barter had also traveled through the area and he absolutely fell in love with Emerald Bay as well. So he took the job and it was pretty lonely. And then Barter had a little dinghy, a little rowboat. And occasionally when he got real lonely, he would row the boat 10 miles from Emerald Bay to North Tahoe, which was the only settlement that was, you know, open during the winter at that time and it's a long way to go but he was physically fit and able to do that and he would go to the bars get really drunk maybe seek some companionship with the ladies and then drunk as could be he would row all the way back and one night it was very windy and choppy his dinghy capsized and he had to swim now he claims he swam 10 miles, which is ridiculous. That was the lore back then, but he probably did swim some distance back to his cabin. And when he got there, two of his toes were frozen solid 
and he self amputated them and he the rumor goes the legend goes that he put those two toes in a little jewelry box and kept them so that's pretty funny and then after that of course he was feeling his mortality and he ended up building a little tomb on Fanet Island, which is the little island in Emerald Bay. And so there was, he, made, he built a casket, a tomb, and he also built a little mini chapel out there. And the idea was when he did pass away, he wanted to be buried there, but that never happened. So we'll fast forward a little bit. And then he did that same trip to North Tahoe, which he'd done many times. And then on another night, same conditions, very windy and choppy, the dinghy capsized, Barter fell in the water, tried to swim, and he was never found. So he was known as the Hermit of Emerald Bay because of the way he lived in that cottage. And he lived there for 12 years, 12 seasons. So it was a long time, but uh, the conditions finally got him or his desire to party in North Tahoe. Subsequently, the land was purchased by the Knights, I think it was Laura Knight ended up owning the property later on. Her dad was a very successful lawyer and he had two younger partners who were brothers and Laura and her sister married the two brothers. And Laura had one child, his name was Nathaniel and he was the quintessential privileged party boy got a lot of money from his parents and he just blew it all on partying with his friends and long story short he was at a brothel one evening very drunk Nathaniel died that night I guess there was no autopsy but it was speculated that there were also drugs involved and at that time you know cocaine was really popular and also opiates so you know there's probably some of that involved could have been a little kind of a shady thing. He's only 25 years old and the cause of death was claimed to be a heart failure. So he was gone. And apparently Mr. Knight, Nathaniel's father was really distraught over the death of his son. And he became ill and never really recovered and died. And Lara became a widow. And I think maybe she remarried again and lost that husband as well somehow. But the bottom line, she ended up being a very wealthy widow and she decided to build this place, this castle down there in Emerald Bay called Vikings Home. And that castle still exists today and we'll hopefully tour it later. It was built with all locally sourced materials. So there's, there's granite blocks and there's the wood was, you know, came from trees that were cut down in the area. And I think she put a moss roof on it and she avoided cutting down some of the, the bigger trees that were right in the area. And she also took ownership of Fanet Island. This uh, castle, I think, was planned in 1928, and it was built entirely over the summer of 1929. And I think at that time, I think it was a half a million dollars, which was a lot of money back then. She would entertain guests, really highfalutin guests. And then on Fanet Island, she built a little tea house, and she would take her guests out there by boat climb up the 150 feet or whatever it was to the little stone tea house and have tea there. And that part of that stone tea house is still there. At that time, she tore down the tomb of the Emerald Bay Hermit, Captain Richard Barter. And then I think sometime in the 1960s, maybe, it was later that the Park Service acquired it. And sometime back in there, the tea house was vandalized, unfortunately, because it was more or less intact. And it had oak tables and furniture in there, and it was really nice. And then in the early days, people vandalized stuff. I can't believe it. You know, there's some, there's some crazy gene that some males have that, where they get great pleasure out of destroying stuff. But historical stuff is it's just kind of weird that that happens. I'm not happy about it. But anyway, the part of the stone structure is still there. So that's kind of the story of Emerald Bay. And right now it's, it's, it's a park, it's a state park. So it's owned by the state at this point. 
And as I said, at some point, Laura Knight gave it up or she passed away and the uh, relatives sold it to the park service. So we can all enjoy it now. We're coming upon another very nice lookout here. The beautiful granite boulder. There's Heavenly Valley again. More boats out there. And I think where that white water is way there where you see it, I think that could be the entrance of Emerald Bay if it's not around that next one, but that might be it, so we'll see. Okay, now we're heading back down a little bit closer to the water. See the beautiful clear water of the lake there? Very nice. So for a while there we were in the trees, so there's less to see. These open areas are really quite spectacular. There is a absolutely beautiful bay right down below me there and green. Coming up is what I believe to be the only actual little stream crossing. And it's pretty low right now. But it's nice. And the rocks are a little wobbly. Very right, green and lush through here. I found some steps here that go down to the water. It's pretty cool. There's a bunch of these little stairways where you can access the water. See how beautiful it is. There's our boaters out there having a good old time. And that little gap there, that's the mouth of Emerald Bay. And I think we're just gonna sit down here and have a sandwich. All right, so that was a pretty nice sandwich break down by the lake and now we're gonna head back toward Emerald Bay to the Vikings home cottage and check that out. And by the way, I'm mentioning Fanet Island. That's the way I'm pronouncing it because that's the way I've heard locals pronounce it. It's F-A-N-A-T-T-E. So if it's French, you could call it Fanet. And when I first saw it, I thought maybe it was Fanet. Now, of course, boating is very popular here in Lake Tahoe, and I don't see myself ever investing in a boat. But a kayak like that is something I could see doing, maybe get an inflatable so I could bring it easily in my rig camping. There's another little stairway down to the water. These are quite common in the area. And we're right along the trail here. All right, there's a sign up ahead, and I see some campgrounds and some vehicles, so we are getting back into civilization. I want to show you this sign here. It says, out and back hike only, no access to Highway 89. So that sort of jives with what we were told. And we're gonna to head to the Vikings home, which is 0.9 mile from here. And this is, I don't know what this campground is actually called, 
but there's a locked gate at the top and I think you have to get your reservations and then you somehow get access to the lock on the gate or something like that. So you can see there's a dock down there and there's a state boat and here's a it's called the Emerald Bay Camp. I know there's a lot of glare on this but you get the idea of some of the old historic brochures. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see with the glare, but that's the idea. And here's the old dock right there. This is the other side of the same kiosk. Some old historic photos again. Emerald Bay State Park. You kind of walk through the paved part and then you can see this sign over here on the right by the wheelbarrows. It says Rubicon Trail continues this way. So we're gonna go down this way and we can see the access to the dock a little bit better there. Here's another bridge to cross and if you look straight through there, just to the left of the big tree in the foreground, I think that's the Vikings home castle. This is a really nice view here. If you look out on the water, you can see the island. I know it's kind of camouflaged, but it's right behind that little uh, jet ski thing. I'll zoom in so you can see a little better. There's the island, now we're gonna zoom in a little bit more. And there's the tea house on top again. Beautiful. Little bridge to cross. If you look through the trees there by those boats, that's Fannet Island. There's the Vikings home and you can see the grass roof up there. Okay, right behind the visitor center is the falls. I'm gonna take the tour of the Vikings home, but I got a little bit of time and it's a very quick hike up here. So that's what we're gonna do. Okay, this is the trail to Eagle Falls. It's short, but steep. This is the visitor center, and this is where you get your tickets for the Vikings home tour. Their study of traditional Scandinavian art and building techniques allowed them to develop a unique style for Vikings home, a style rooted firmly in the timeless Norse design. Mr. Paul made a ticket. I made it to the falls. Yeah, how was it? It's good. It's a little low now. Yeah, yeah, but it's I, definitely getting to that time of the year where everything starts to lower. Is it in the springtime? Is it like raging? Yeah. 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 All right, thank you. Have a nice day. Mm -hmm. <sighs> you done the tour yet? No. No, it's, it's three o'clock, so oh, I'm yeah, just right. killing a little bit of time. Let's go ahead over there. Yeah. Okay, this is the beach right in front of Vikings Home. And I'm gonna show you that and the tour boat out there. So apparently you can take a tour. And dead ahead is the Fennet Island. Here's the Vikings Home where we will take a tour and few moments. It is five to three and we got our three o'clock tour.
and restoring all the woodwork on the outside of the home. If you look above the doorway, you can see they haven't touched that area yet. This has been restored and this project is funded by tour tickets. So thank you. Now I'm going to start the tour out here. I want to give you some background information before we go inside the home. And it's mostly going to be on the woman who built this house. Wonderful woman. Her name was Laura Knight. She built Vikings Home in 1929. Now she was actually from the Chicago area. Born there in 1864. Married a lawyer, James Moore. And they became very wealthy, all thanks to the stock market. Did very well in the stock market. They did have one son in their marriage, but he did pass away suddenly at the age of 25. Now when they lost their son, the Moores decided to leave Chicago. They came out west to California, ended up at Santa Barbara, bought property down at Montecito, started plans to build an estate down there. They also bought some property up here at Lake Tahoe over on the North Shore. Mr. Moore never got to see either of those estates. He passed away shortly after their move out west. They had been married 32 years. That was a very good marriage for Laura. She did remarry a second time to a friend of the family, Harry Knight. Now that marriage didn't go so well. In fact, she ended up getting a divorce in 1927. And right after that divorce is when she bought the property here at Emerald Bay. So she was actually single and in her 60s when she took on this project here. Now at the time, this property was owned by two women, mother and a daughter, the Armstrong family, running a fishing resort over here. Laura came over for a visit and ended up buying the property from them. She got 239 acres and it cost her $250,000. But it included all of this shoreline out here on both sides of the bay out to the island there. All the property that's behind the house that goes up to the highway, property across that highway to secure the water rights up there and then she had the island thrown in too. I mean why not? Uh, but this was a summer home for her just for family and friends to spend their summers together mid-June through mid-September. Now she did hire a Swedish architect he designed the home for her and she wanted a Scandinavian style home because she had traveled there quite a bit and this area right here reminded her of the fjords that she had seen over there. So they brought in 200 men to work on this project, housed them on the property, and they built this house within five months, which is pretty amazing. They also put the little castle on that island too. That is known as the tea house. Every now and then, Laura and her guests took motorboats over there and had tea. So it kind of gives you a little bit of an insight into the lifestyle going on down here. But this was a very quiet, secluded area down here. You, you had to have her permission to come onto any of the shoreline here. Not a bad place to hang out in the summertime. Now they enjoyed it for 14 summers. 1945, when she came in on her 15th summer, she did pass suddenly here at the home at the age of 82. One of the richest women in the nation at that time. Very kind, generous woman. She had many charities she was involved with. The one closest to Laura's heart, sending young women through college. That wasn't going on too much at that time, so she opened that door wide. Now, when she passed away, a good chunk of her money went to her charities. This was offered up to the family, and they all turned it down. Didn't want it. So it ended up with Mr. Harvey West, a lumberman down in Placerville. He used it as a vacation home for his family, and when he got it, it did include all of Laura's furniture. So when you go inside, he kept it all original. That's all of Laura's furniture that's inside the home. Now, he only had it for five years. It got to be too expensive, time to sell. He worked out an agreement with the state of California, and he gave them everything, and they paid him $125,000. That was a donation by Mr. West because he had decided this needed to be preserved for everybody in the future to enjoy. What year so, was that? 1953. Okay. So this is known as the Harvey West unit of Emerald Bay State Park. So thank you Harvey West for doing that. <laughs> now I'm gonna take you inside the home and I'm gonna show you what's going on in there. So I wanna welcome you inside. Now Laura and I, when she bought the property right away, she had a little meeting with her architect. They were talking about the design for the home, and she made it very clear from the start, this house could not outshine that beautiful scenery out there. It had to blend in. That was a very big deal for her. And the house ended up becoming known as the Hidden Castle, so she pulled that off rather nicely. 
But in 1928, when she bought the property, they started construction really quick. So she turned her attention to furniture, took a trip with the architect, and they went to Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Norway. And they brought back Scandinavian antiques for the home. Now, some of them are from the 17th century. Some of them are earlier than that. And then reproductions of museum pieces were done so well, you couldn't tell which was Laura's and which one came from the museum. This bridal table is one of her reproductions. This is called the Swedish bridal table. When a woman got married in Sweden, that's what her family would give the couple for a wedding gift. That table in front of the windows, now that is a 17th century table, and that came from a castle in Norway. The little chair up front came out of Finland. It's called a three-legged peasant stool, and we're told the reason for three legs is because of the floors in those homes. A little uneven, kind of like our rock floor out here. So you're more stable if you only have three legs. Put that fourth one on, you're gonna tip a little more. Mm -hmm. Piano here is a 1929 Steinway piano. It's really a beautiful instrument, and Laura Knight did not know how to play the piano. She had a lot of guests who could play it for her. And it sounds beautiful when you hear it played in this room. Uh, the acoustics in here are perfect, but they would have concerts in here after dinner. Now you're gonna see a lot of metal pieces all throughout the home, and the majority of them were designed by the architect and forged on site during the five months of construction. Now you're gonna go upstairs, there's latches on some of the doors up there that are from the 13th century. So it's really hard to tell which were the antiques and which one were made right on property. Door in the back of the room, there's a peek into the tower of the house. It's called the Chieftain's Tower, and that's the library, Laura Knight's favorite room here. She spent a lot of her mornings in there with her secretary. She had a lot of business things she had to take care of while she was here at Lake Tahoe. The rug in there, though, that's cashmere. 1929, she paid $40,000 for that rug. So I have never stepped foot in that room. I just get to lean in and turn on the light switch, and that's as far as I've ever been. Now, the wood you see that's painted, it's not painted. It's actually a water-based stain. They covered it with a product called banana oil, finished it off with white wax, and wherever you see this in the house, it's all original. Nothing in the house has been touched. And you're also going to see a lot of tapestries hung on the walls. They didn't hang pictures and paintings. They liked to hang tapestries. That tapestry that's behind you, she brought that back from Finland. And then we have our dragons, which we have quite a few of. All shapes and sizes here at Viking Home, and it is a symbol of protection for the Vikings. These two beings are carved right here at the home by a Swedish wood carver. He did all the intricate wood carvings. They are called pregnant dragons. There is a small dragon on the center of a bigger dragon. So there's oh, yeah. four dragons on each beam. Mm -hmm. Now there was one day we got curious. We thought we'd walk around and see how many dragons we could find. When we hit 90, we gave up. So I can say <laughs> that it's over 100. There's a lot. There, pretty soon you're going to start seeing them popping out at you. That is the main dining room of the home. So that's where all her meals were served. And she was fussy with the meals. She wanted you to be on time and dressed for them. And right now, nobody would pass the dress code to go in there. 4.30, tea's gonna be served out on that front porch, and then dinner at 6.30. Dinner time, men had to be in their best suit and ties, and the ladies in their best dresses. So that was her era. Kind of made it special too, but you had to bring a lot of changes of clothing when you stayed here. There is a yellow room in the back of the dining room. That's called the maid's pantry. That's not a kitchen. The kitchen is to the left. And you're going to see the kitchen from a doorway that's outside. But all the food prepared in the kitchen passed to the maids in the pantry, and then they brought the food out to the table. And there is one other doorway in that dining room. It's on the right-hand corner. It's called the morning room. That room, you could have tea or coffee before breakfast, cool drink in the afternoon. It was like a hangout spot for the guests. But it's under restoration right now. It has some earthquake damage in it. Now you're gonna get to go upstairs and there's a total of six bedrooms. Each one has its own full bathroom. Everything up there is original. So the linens, fixtures, all of it. The guests usually stayed on this side and on this side at the end of the hall is the bedroom that's in the tower. It's called the chieftain's bedroom. Then Laura had her section over here. When you go down two stairs, that means you've entered into Laura's section of the home. And her room will be at the very end of the hallway, it faces the lake, it's a pale blue room. But right outside her door is a set of stairs that goes to the third floor, which is a screened in sleeping porch. And she would go up there at night to sleep because she had a nice mountain breeze that would blow through there. 
but you cannot go up to the third floor. There's a picture on the stairway. You'll be able to see what it looks like. And one other thing is you'll see some stairs that come down. They drop right into that maid's pantry, and that is how the staff would access upstairs. All the stained glass windows were brought in from Sweden. What is the correct pronunciation of the island? Finette. Finette. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I have no idea why it's called Finette. It's gone through a few different names. Yeah. And no, I don't know if I've ever heard any explanation. I've heard locals call it Fanet, so they're they're yeah. incorrect? Or? Well, you know, tomato, tomato. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I call it Finette. We call it Finette here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's really too bad about the, the vandalism happened in the 60s? or? Yeah. So there's some vandalism in the weather. And um, it's hard to protect that over there, yeah. you know? So, yeah, that's, we've had vandalism here too, you'll see. Like outside, there's some blue tape on some of these stained glass because somebody's broken the glass. And to get it replaced, you have to bring it in from Sweden. Now these latches on these doors are the ones from the 13th century. And the custom in a Viking's home is that the staff and the guests would have locks on the outside of their bedrooms. The chief had his lock on the inside. At night, he'd lock everybody in. In the morning, he'd let them out. So that would lessen his chance of being um, attacked during the night. Oh. So she wanted that true, authentic storyline. She never locked anybody in, but there is a release on the inside, but those are sliding locks that are on there. But those are from the 13th century. They're really beautiful. So this is the front door. So this is the main entryway for the house. Yeah. And that door currently I cannot open. Usually we'd be able to walk right out into that courtyard, um, but the bottom hinge failed about two weeks ago, and it's a very thick, heavy door. So I can't open the door, which means to get out to that courtyard, got to go outside, around the building, into the back. Mm -hmm. So it makes the tour a little bit different, but you know, when you have an old house, you just have to learn to pivot with it. So this is the main entryway. A guest would arrive, they'd come through the front door right there, and they'd be greeted by Selma the Clock. She was carved and painted by the architect as a housewarming gift. Now originally Selma did have a wind-up face on her, but the stay put in the battery operated, and up until a couple days ago, she was keeping perfect time. So Sal oh, I think Selma's gone on vacation for a little bit. That closet right there, that is a coat closet. And that was carved and painted by the architect as a surprise birthday gift for Laura Knight. He came in in 1935 before she arrived, carved and painted that. And when she arrived, opened the door to put her co coat away, that was waiting for her. Mm -hmm. And something like that meant a lot to her, that gesture. The box on the wall, that is a Swedish mailbox. And the guests could put their mail in there. Then the chauffeur took it and met the mail boat at the mouth of the bay. And if you wanted mail delivered here, you just had to have it addressed to Viking's home, Emerald Bay, California, and it would find its way here. The house was all wired with electricity right from the start, but she had to run off of a generator for the first three summers while they pu pulled it from the south shore of the lake and she had all the modern conveniences. They really weren't roughing it too much down here, but this was her more rustic estate out of all her other estates, her grand estates. Now, just for the main house, this is about just around 5,000 square foot, and it costs about $125,000 to build. But she originally had 18 buildings on the property. We only have four that remain now. Where you bought your tour ticket, that was where the chauffeur stayed. So that was the chauffeur's cottage. Well, I'm going to show you a few things going on in the courtyard. Now, did you guys walk down from the parking area down by Kingston Trail? Uh-huh. 
Okay, Viking Sum Trail is the original driveway of the house. So Laura and I put the road in to have her access down here, and most of her guests would come in by car. So they would drive down the road, pull through this breezeway, and out into the courtyard up to the front door. And once you got to that spot, you were spoiled for the rest of the time you were here. All your things were put up into your room for you. Chauffeur would take your car, she had two chauffeurs down here, to another location. Washed it, serviced it, and filled it with gasoline. That was a gas pump, somebody noticed that. That was her gas pump over here. So a guest never left here without a full tank of gas. So she saw to every single thing she could. Swimming, boating, hiking, fishing, whatever you wanted to do, she'd make it happen. Beautiful cruise craft motorboat called the Valkyrie. They took that all over the lake. But one thing Laura and I did was during the day encourage her guests to sit down and relax and just enjoy this beautiful scenery here. And my favorite view, I gotta say, are those granite mountains back there. I kind of find that a little awe-inspiring. I know everybody likes the lake, but you stare at that day after day, it really gets under your skin. Now, what she did out here in the courtyard, created her own little Scandinavian village. The main house was designed to look like a castle she had seen in Sweden. This section right here, this resembles an 11th century church. She saw that in Norway. There are some dragons at the top. There's actually eight dragons on the roof to protect it. It also has the spikes on the roof line, and those are called fierce branches. And they were meant by the Vikings to ward off evil spirits, or at least trap them before they could make it through windows or doors. Now, she incorporated a lot of Viking folklore here into the design, and it really does make it interesting. Side sections. She wanted these to resemble peasant homes and barns. And the Sodrus in Scandinavia, they do that to insulate their building. But for Laura Knight, it was about the look. And hers were covered in wildflowers native to Lake Tahoe. So that was a lot of color up on those roofs. She also put a sprinkler system on both roofs. And it was watering this morning, so that all still works. Now this has changed out here in the courtyard since she had the home. She had some beautiful fir trees in the middle here. They were tall trees like out here and she designed the courtyard around those trees. They had to cut them out a few years ago because of rot disease. Mm -hmm. And when they did that, we went from full shade to full sun. So that roof went down to the dirt right away. We lost her garden. So the hope is to get it all replanted with sun tolerant uh, plants. The main kitchen is in the corner. Next to it's a staff dining room. Those two doors will be opened. The maids had these rooms in the breezeway. Each had their own bedroom, but shared bathrooms in that hallway and I will open up one maid's room. These two doors were for her Swedish cooks. So they had their own bedroom and bathroom. So they were a little higher on that hierarchy of the staff. Now this section right here, downstairs and the upstairs, that was a caretaker's apartment. Laura would leave here mid-September. She'd go back to Santa Barbara for the winter time, but she did have somebody who stayed here through the winter, kept an eye on the property. So they would stay in this section that is a three bedroom, two bath apartment. I think it's the cutest spot on the whole property. Um, but currently the state of California offers that as housing for its summer employees. So somebody gets to live in this section right here. Now those two buildings, garages and workshops, and there's a big cedar tree right behind the stone building. And when they started construction, Laura Knight made it very clear, no big trees were to be cut down. So they had to build around that tree. She wouldn't let them cut it down. They needed heat, right? Did they heat with wood or? No, or they so didn't heat? she did have her fireplaces. Uh -huh. And if it was a cool morning or evening, spring or fall, they would light the fireplaces. Mm. Otherwise they really didn't need it. Except that section does have a um, propane heater and a wood burning stove. So that area is protected mm. in the winter. Because he would right. stay here. Yeah, he was protected in that section, but the rest of the house, they didn't need air conditioning or heat. Yeah. But Harvey West, when he owned it, he did come up in the winter time. He had to come in by boat and he put radiant heat in. They took all those radiators out, mm -hmm. um, but his boiler is still down in the basement. Yeah. It's so huge, you can't get it out. Yeah. Yeah. And did the staff follow her or was it just a specific staff for up here? No, it was her staff from Santa Barbara. So they did so come with So 15 of them would okay. come up. Oh. Yeah, and then she'd hire about five more locals. So she oh. had around 20 
during the summer, but she had 18 buildings total. Yeah. So, and, and the other buildings were primarily for guests? One was a big guest house. She had a house for her secretary and his family. She even built a little house for the two ladies mm. she bought the property from. So if they wanted mm. to come up, they had um, a place to stay. Right. Other support so, buildings where you bought mm. your tour tickets, that were the chauffeurs, mm. that was mm. their residence. Mm. Two stone walls that went out to the lake in front mm. of that. We saw that. And that was their that. boat house. That's what okay. we got. And they, they kept a boat in there. It was called the Chipmunk. Hey everyone, thank you so much for coming along. I really enjoyed that hike. It ended up being about 12 miles. I've got a little bit more to go before I get back to the car, but I'm just overlooking the Emerald Bay there, this Finette Island out there. And by the way, I was pronouncing it correct. I heard a local call it Fanet, and I thought, oh, well, they know more than I do. So anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for coming along. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, thanks for watching.